Okay, so let's talk about another fun topic. So temp file support. There are, there are many workloads, there are test cases that create a temp file um, and then hard link it uh, into the namespace. You know, it's not required. It hasn't been around forever. This isn't something that was in original Linux, apparently. Um, so what is a temp file? As you guys know, it's an unnamed file that, I mean, you can create a, a silly rename weird file name or you could make it hidden or do whatever, but, but file systems uh, don't have to have a name for it. Uh, the path name only has a directory and uh, you know, there's not much path, it's just basically a create and an open. So it's very similar to create. Um, it is create, I mean, it's, but the only difference is that this file is gonna disappear uh, when it's closed. So there are currently eight file systems that support temp files. Uh, primarily BTRFS, ext 4 XFS, but uh, actually nine, or maybe miscounted here, nine of them. Um, there's a problem though, and this is like an obvious inherent problem if you think about a temp file. The temp file is supposed to be deleted when it's closed. There are two types of file systems, right? There's file systems that have a kind of a, a, a two-step create that creates a file and then opens it, and there's file systems that have a one-step create where create returns the file descriptor that it just opened. So for half the file systems, the act of splitting the creation of a temp file into two steps, where you create a temp file, close it, and then reopen it, defeats the whole purpose of a temp file. Um, my intent when I create a temp file is to create a file marked delete on close, right? We have in the protocol spec a delete on close. But the instant I close it, it's going, to, it's going to go away. So you're gonna create the temp file and then open it, and it's gonna be deleted by the time you get to open. So you can defer close, that's possible. We have directory, le or we have handle leases and deferred close support in SMB. But it creates the small possibility of races, and it's also slower. So you know, you're doing a slightly more chatty thing than you should, and there's a slight possibility of some race someday. Um, so, some file systems can work around this uh, by not actually opening a temp file when it's being created. They can use a path-based call that doesn't return a handle, uh, but that doesn't work for other FS. You know, once the link count gets to zero, it goes away, but, you know, this, this is also suboptimal. It's not... A... So here's an example of creating a temp file from one of the simple examples. Here's RAMFS, what they do. Pretty simple, right? Get inode and then D underscore temp file. Very simple, and then they export the dot temp file. You know, this is trivial amount of code. So, what is the code path that goes on here, right? So, when you, uh, the inode op temp file is called with your mode bits and it returns an entry um, on a directory inode. So, you do this path open at do temp file, VFS temp file, temp file. So, in the calling sequence, um, if this isn't a temp file, then it's going to call DOO path and then VFS open. But in the temp file path, it's going to call VFS open after it's done this uh, create temp file. So lookup open, on the other hand, just simply calls atomic open. So we don't have that issue of create, close, open. You know, so it's, a, it's easier in the, in the open create path than it is in this one. This is the only create path that has this problem that I see. It's one of the few. So if you look in do temp file, it looks up the path, calls out to the VFS for temp file, and then simply opens it. I mean, this can be kind of merged together, right, to be, you know, if the file system supports this as one operation, have the temp file return the, you can see may open returns the, uh, so have it return, uh, you know, the VFS open, right? So the VFS open returns file, right? So basically, have the file system do the temp file and VF, you know, basically like VFS open, have it do the, the temp file create and return the file. This is similar to atomic open. So add a create doc directory inode operation called atomic temp file, and then that makes it, for any file system that chooses to do this, this makes an atomic operation, speeds up things a little bit, a little bit clearer to read as well, and it avoids the open create close race for file systems that, uh, for which create is a handle-based operation, and it doesn't require changes to anything else. So it's a fairly simple one to imagine, 
because as you can see in do temp file, we're just splitting uh, you know, the open artificially from the create of the temp file. And uh, what it means from my case is that uh, it would, uh, you create the file market delete on close. If you do a hard link to it, obviously, the newly created link won't be delete on close. Um, and then we, uh, we mark it as, uh, as hidden um, and give it some you know, random name that doesn't show up in the directory. Would it be better to go through the already existing Atomic Open just with OTEMP files set? I, I looked at that and it's possible. Um, that brings up a topic for next year's LSF, which is if you look at the file this stuff is in, the, the, this code, um, it's kind of ugly actually. Um, there's a lot of great VFS code. I don't think that the I don't think that our, the way we handle open and create is the easiest to read. You know, VFS open, path lookup at, do temp file. If you look at some of these functions I'm talking about, path open at, and um, you know, the lookup open, they're kind of confusing. There is a much bigger problem I see, and that is that there's lots of cases where we unnecessarily do stat, does the file exist, and open or create, when we could have done one operation. So there's lots of cases for a network or cluster where we're calling two operations. But I sort of feel like. So when you say stat, you mean user space is doing stat open? No, I mean that, that the act of doing a create, very frequently, the act of doing open or create will revalidate a whole bunch of dentries. Now, some of that's, sure, we have to do. But when you get to the final dentry, in a lot of cases, there's no need, actually, to revalidate the final dentry because it's implied in the open call and we could have done the error path by saving one operation on the wire by not sending the, the query across the wire to see if, so in any case, the open call itself could have been just sent, saving one round trip on the network. Uh, so, so, so this is combining uh, the lookup yeah, look up and open. Right, and the, the look would fail. Yeah, and there, there's, uh, there's cases where we do this and cases we don't. But what I was saying was that reading this code at one in the morning last night was confusing, and I've seen it a hundred times, but you know, some of you guys may know this code better. When I say this code, I mean the bigger part of your question. It's trivial to imagine the change I'm describing, right, where temp file and op open of the temp file um, is just a call out to a, to a file system to do the same thing if it's available if that function's available. Right. But looking at the bigger picture of how to merge this a little bit more sanely into, um, where is that thing called? Uh, into uh, VFS open. Um, anyway, there's cleanup that can be done that has nothing to do with the temp file story in mm -hmm. these code paths, and I think it's worth looking at. I think it might be desirable to at least try whether we, if, if if there are no weird issues uh, popping up, obviously with this, there's a tendency for VFS. If we could do it for all file systems, so not just at an atomic temp file, but and have another temp file operation, yeah. but just have a single one and convert all file systems. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. And like I said, we have some test coverage here, so it's not like unheard of. I don't want to overstate the importance of temp files. I don't think NFS has. For so user space, they are indeed quite Im uh, quite important. We uh, use them. We use them a lot. I mean, I guess you know, BTRFS, ext 4 XFS covers example. ninety something percent of the local cases, right? So you know, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't think Fuse did, but it, it, I don't know whether it is possible to combine the some file inode operation with the file open operation in all cases. I think OverlayFS maybe wants to do, create a temp file, copy some attributes, and then effectively open it. A union mount was going to work like that, but union mount got dropped. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely worth experimenting with this. Well, um, I, right now, well, creating a temp file over, overlay does use that, but you can always create a temp file without opening it, right? Well, that, that's what we do at the moment. But if we force combination of when you want a temp file, thou shalt open it at the same time, is that a problem? 
So where you don't have the option of creating a TUMP file and then opening it and doing something in between. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it's not required to have a file descriptor, so I don't, I don't know why we would uh, not allow creating a TEMP file. I mean, that should be fine without opening a file. I mean, I mean both. We can do both. I mean, I from not. user space, this is a flag on, you know, creating a file, right? I mean, it's, I don't know, just, you know, from the user space perspective, it turns a file handle, right? But um, anyway, it, uh, I also have an, one more short topic if we have a couple, we have a few minutes left, right? Um, so, you know, any feedback on this would be, would be useful. Um, we talked a little bit about these yesterday, and I just wanted to, to make sure that we're on the same page. So, you know, StatX is awesome. We can set and, you know, encrypt it at rest and compress it at rest and some other things. If you look at the current StatX flags, these are the current ones. And did, did I miss any, David? I mean, it's a little bit I think bit that's all of them. Uh... Some of these are actually not, uh, it's kind of an interesting story here, but, but that's the current list. But it's also a little bit misleading because, and I'm not sure that, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but three of these flags aren't file system flags. They're VFS flags. So they don't, they're not persisted, right? So um, compressed, for example, is stored by DTRFS, if 64 NTFS, uh, immutable, et cetera, right? But, but um, DAX, mount root, and auto mount aren't persisted. They're just, there's something that's, they're, they're information from the VFS about the thing, the object you're looking at. Yes. They're, they're manufactured from some other property. Yeah. So I agree. And, and, but anyway, it's an interesting thing. So they're, they're, they're useful. Well, um, in, in at least one case, so in the case of AFS, actually AFS and NFS and SIFS, the auto mount may actually be persistent. Because it may be a property of the underlying file system. Oh, yeah. So, so it's persisted, but not as the attribute flag. It's persisted as, so it checks some other thing and then sets this flag based on the other thing, right? It, it is effectively an attribute flag in AFS, for example. Yeah. Or probably in NFS. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, so these are fine. It's a little bit confusing when you look at Verity. Like, what does Verity actually mean? It seems like it's a read-only file that has higher integrity. Yeah, and I mean, like, Verity means something very specific, right? Yeah. It's the FS Verity stuff. We, yeah. ButterFS, CX64, F2FS, all support. It's like a... Uh, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. tree of everything. And it's a specific type of data integrity, and it's a specific attribute that it's read-only. Right. Um, so it has these two properties. Uh, you could imagine, for argument's sake, taking an NFS file... And, or an AFS file or an SMB file and marking it read-only and then setting some attribute that tells the server to do something strict. Um, and that might actually have even more value because in the NFS or AFS or SMB world, you have more opportunities for corruption as you're copying it from here to the server room a thousand miles away. But right now, Verity does seem very specific, very, very specific. Yeah, it's, it's very specific. It's like yeah. on the order of eCryptFS. Yeah. So. So, the StatX flags that, uh, that I would suggest we consider, and obviously, you know, we could look at other file systems to see. BTRFS probably has some internal flags that could be added, but the, the four that just jump out at me that just seem like no-brainers are there. This isn't an issue so much for me in SMB, but as I think about this, it's very common that people have local files that have Underneath it, they're cached in Amazon Cloud or Azure Cloud or Google Cloud. And so accessing those files uh, can be slow, but they're, they're basically offline, hosted remote. Uh, that's a common scenario. And there's also the reverse, where um, an operating system is told, do not take this file offline because I can't afford the latency to read it you know, from Amazon Cloud or Azure Cloud or whatever. So please don't. Now, these are not really relevant as much for network file systems. We just report this. Um, so, for example, if you were mounting to a server here in this room and that server had files that were back to some cloud provider, that might be relevant. But it's not really something I, deal, I have to deal with. I just report it. 
but there are lots of local file systems that have weird caching stuff that uh, makes a hierarchical stuff off in the cloud or something. So offline and pinned are common ones. There are, like take Windows example, they have additional flags that allow you to know more about what's offline. Is it the data? Is it the metadata? So there are other attribute flags in Windows and Macs and things, but the highest level ones they provide are offline and pinned. Those seem kind of like no-brainers. Um, I can report these, NTFS can report these, uh, and I'm sure there's others that could report it. Integrity and the opposite of integrity, you know, this is some scratch file we don't care about, don't bother doing expensive checks, or please file system, do the best you can for checks. These are kind of uh, relatively easy to explain, and the file system is allowed to do whatever it wants under that, unlike Verity, where you have a very specific Merkle tree you have to use in a very specific algorithms. This is just a general thing. So in a Windows or a Mac, you'd right mouse button on a file and mark it. Just like the same you do for compressed or encrypted, you just click a checkbox that say, you know. So I, these are the four. I, I kind of question the yeah. underlying assumption that it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, the integrity subsystem in Linux, for example, um, there's, it's hugely configurable and there's policy yep. and all kinds of stuff and I'm not sure how a flag like this would be used. Yeah, so I mean, the, the way I would describe it is, so I'm not as familiar with how the back end of let's say Azure works or how Oracle Cloud or whatever works, but, but what I understand is that uh, the take compressed or encrypted, when you select that flag, it's compressed or encrypted at rest the algorithm used to compress it at rest when you select this flag is up to the file system to determine. This is a hint. Right, but why wouldn't someone always want integrity in their file storage? Well, the point is this is not integrity. This is asking for the strongest integrity possible because this is the most important file on my system. These are set, you know, one out of a thousand files, and it's asking for additional integrity checks on it. The opposite, like a temp file, would be no integrity checks. The 99.9% .9 of the files, or 99% of the files, have whatever the file system is doing, which is usually pretty significant integrity checks. Sure, I just feel like there are, are and this is so rest. many shades of, of integrity that one could request that having a single bit is probably not going to be useful. I mean, that's possibly true. I, I, would, I would like to see a lot more exposed about what is being requested yeah. and... So the applications, I think, need to have a little more control. Yeah, so the general thought I have on this is that we have hundreds of file systems available via Fuse. We have hundreds of file systems available via other mechanisms. I don't know all the integrity mechanisms they support, but we're asking the file system to do its best effort, and they can ignore it. And so in some way, the main really question is, what, which of these would the applications actually use? Well, so, so with the would it be an Pinned application or would it be the admin? In other words, the admin provisions your lap, you know, you, you start yeah. work at Red Hat and Red Hat provisions your laptop yeah. and on the laptop they mark five or six key Red yeah. Hat security files with this tag yeah. when they but, provision the system. Maybe it's not an app. Yeah. But putting this in Statex is you, you're expecting applications to actually be using these regularly as opposed to putting it somewhere else where they would have to go and query it on the site. So like uh, the chatter, the atter flags in the XT3. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the other off thing is... Offline is the main one I can see because that says, don't touch this unless you need to. And that's yep. a really good hint for desktop environments. Don't go and read, don't cut, uh, read, try and read the magic number on each of these because it's going to be slow. The rest, I'm not so sure about. The file system might need to know about them because the file system might need to do something with them. And there may be, may be requirements that we add somewhere for uh, in, someone who actually wants to set these flags to actually read them and set them. I mean, but I, th I think in Statex, offline is possibly the only one I'd really put through Statex. Yeah. Because well, I said... So, yeah, yeah, Steve, I think there may be an assumption that I'm hearing in what you're saying that I don't believe is true, which is StatX is literally just for stat. There is no interface to set, say, StatX adder pinned via a Linux system call today, right? This is only for, StatX is designed so applications can find out information about a file. 
right? There is no system administrator interface to magically set StatX adder integrity. And so the question I have is, what applications actually would need, want to know, would have an interest in understanding, say, that a file has the no scrub attribute set on it? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. So um, I, I hadn't thought about it that way. I thought that it was relatively easy to set it compressed and encrypted through tooling, but I haven't played with the tooling for setting compressed yeah, encrypted. it's not via statics. Yeah. Right, so, so yeah. there, yeah, so the, let's, we should set some history here, right? Which yeah. is, originally, there was an IOCTL that was ext2 specific that was used to set a maximum of 32 um, bits. Right. Uh, and also allowed you to read 32 bits of attribute flags, and it was originally intended to be only for ext2. At some point, other file systems said, hey, that looks like a really interesting interface. Let's hoist that up to the VFS and translate um, those 32-bit flags, some of which were read-only, some of which were read-write, to the no. FS. But the problem is that for ext2 and ext4, that 32-bit um, flag field is literally the on-disk representation of those right. attribute flags. And as ext4 started adding more attribute flags that had absolutely no relevance to other file systems, people started saying, wait a moment, why are we reading these attribute hmm. flags for which we only had 32, some of which were ext4 specific, some of which were read-write, some of which were read-only. And so hmm. StatX got created as a way for, for applications to read attributes in a namespace that was separate from the chatter uh, LS adder ioctals, right? right? But at the moment, there only exists an ioctal to, or system call, StatX, to read the attributes. Mm -hmm. There is no system call that I know of that allows mm -hmm. you to set file system independent StatX flags such, in such a way that they can be plumbed through so right. that a system administrator could ask a file system, please set StatX adder integrity, right? And this is where Chuck's concern yeah. comes into mind, which is that from a system administrator's perspective, you may want to be, it's very, very file system dependent what sort of integrity services might be requested and it might be a hell of a lot more than just a single bit, right? It might, yeah. it might be, you know, use this quantum proof crypto mm -hmm. checksum. It might be use this other thing, right? right? So StatX is only for reading. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I, that's a very good point, by the way. But to be fair, um, we have a, a history in lots of operating systems, including Linux, of, you know, you provide an IOCTL or an FSTTL, whatever, you provide an IOCTL. And that IOCTL has all kinds of details about what exactly the integrity, whatever. But StatX is just cheaply reporting that this file uh, is but, a. Uh, but that's the main point of StatX. I mean, it has to be cheap. Yeah. Because we call it a lot. Yeah. Because the other three offline are, are grant putting in StatX. Yeah. The other three things, this is what I was thinking of FS Info for. Yeah. As a sep separate thing where you can say, tell me more about, g give me these other, other flags that aren't so commonly used. And also, have another thing that tells me, what does the file system actually support? Because it's re really, all these flags are three mm. state. There's, it's on, it's off, it's not supported. Yeah, like pinned is a good example. Or at least like, three states. I think most servers, most operating systems, until the last four or five years, haven't supported the concept of refusing, you know, you yeah. can set an IOCTL or whatever that, that says, do not take that file yeah. offline. Um, uh, and then there'd be an extension to FS info, which is the set info, yeah. where you take, say, this FS info attribute, change it, yeah. which is where, well, James is in the other room, I think, but I think we have something about this tomorrow, yeah. where he, he, he wants to a more com a comprehensive in interface with setting and changing these yeah. things. Also, you mentioned encrypt. 
as a so we, we've thing. already got a, a good the, interface for setting and, and changing attributes and it's called the extended attribute interface mm -hmm. maybe we could define extended attributes for all of these and then statics could be the fast path for reading those extended yeah. attributes and they'd be set by the extended attribute interface. Yeah, I mean, to me that's fine and that actually maps with some of what the Macs do, right? The Macs use extended attributes for a lot of these kind of things, the Mac OS, but you know, I'm fine and, and if there's no way to set it in the short term, I'm fine with that. They but but I, what I'm worried about though is that the first one, I have so much like PTSD from years ago thinking about you know, if you don't report this, the nightmare you have is you have a GUI, some customer writes a GUI, and this actually happened in real life, right? So they write a GUI, and some of the files are backed up into the Amazon cloud, and they open a window, and suddenly everything stops on the system for a long, long time, because the GUI wants to read the first 500 bytes of the file. And so, you know, that's something I personally remember having to deal with, so being able to advertise cheaply that it's offline, uh, not the metadata, but the data. Yeah, yeah uh, I, so I, okay, I think we've, we've wandered off into the weeds here and it's lunchtime. So yep. let's, uh, let's call, it, call this one tabled, move it to the hallway track. Uh, people on the phone, we will be back in an hour in the same room. Is this still on? Yeah, just uh, wanna say, um, Kent, Kent.